Good evening, everyone. Welcome to St. Bart's on this, the third Sunday of Advent. You may notice that at your Advent wreath at home when you lit it this morning, after mom and dad woke up early to make you waffles, <laughs> that this week's candle is not purple, but is rose-colored or commonly called pink. That's because this Sunday is like a joyful Sunday called Gaudet Sunday. So it's meant to be in this time of growing darkness in kind of a dreary season and often penitential. It's meant to be a, a Sunday of joy as we get even closer to the celebration of Christmas. So I hope you have a bulletin with you today as we're worshiping together. If you're worshiping with us online, please make sure and download your bulletin. Let's stand together and pray and we'll begin our worship. God in heaven, thank you for this joyful Sunday. Thank you that no matter what you are reigning on your throne and you're shining down your light on us. You who are pure love and pure light. As we prepare for the season of Christmas, as we prepare for your second coming, keep us awake, keep us watchful, and most of all, keep us hopeful in a deep and abiding joy. Thank you for your provision for us. Thank you for your guiding us, for your shepherding us. Thank you for your love for us. We pray all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our opening song of praise. Yeah. 
As the candles for the third Sunday of Advent are lit, let us pray. Almighty God, you have made us in your image and will renew the heavens and the earth for your habitation. Renew us also by the power of your Holy Spirit in this holy season of Advent. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Rejoice, rejoice, Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Together let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord, we surrender to you in this season of waiting, in this season of expectation, even in this year of 2020 when we just don't know what's coming next, we surrender to you and we trust you 
and we not only acknowledge but remind our sometimes weak and failing spirits that you are good and your mercy endures forever, that your mercies are new every morning, and that we can trust you. So we surrender all. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. In heavenly King, holy flame, wind of God, fire of God, Holy Spirit, come and abide in us powerfully in new ways so that as the darkness of Advent passes and the light of Christmas and your incarnation, Lord Jesus Christ, dawns upon us, we may be filled to the full with the measure of the knowledge and the fullness of God. Come, Lord, help us, we pray. The Lord be with you. O Lord Jesus Christ, you sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Grant that the ministers and stewards of your mysteries may likewise make ready your way by turning the hearts of the disobedient toward the wisdom of the just, that at your second coming to judge the world, we may be found a people acceptable in your sight. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. Today's first lesson comes from the book of Isaiah. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed." They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their food. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering the sheaves. The second lesson comes from 1 Thessalonians. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, 
Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seeks to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray together. Lord, Lord God, we pray that we could be like John the Baptist in this passage, that we would rejoice at your voice. Um, on this dark, cold day, in this dark, cold time, Lord, we pray that you would teach us the meaning of joy and that we would accept your invitation to rejoice even in the midst of hard things, even in the midst of suffering. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good evening, St. Bart's. Hope you're doing well. For those of you here in person, hello. For those of you online later, hello as well. Uh, as Jay mentioned at the top of the service, we have a uh, rose-colored candle tonight. It is a sign of joy in the midst of a season of longing and waiting. So why not talk about joy, even though it's bitterly cold outside, even though this is one of the hardest years any of us have ever lived through, if not the hardest year, why not talk about joy? Let's just, just go for it. Let's see where we get and talk about joy tonight. So... I wanna start, because we're within striking distance of Christmas, I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit and I'm gonna talk about my, f my favorite uh, Christmas carol. My very, very favorite Christmas carol is O Holy Night. Shout out. If you get the right kind of singer, like my wife could do or Becky could do, and they hit that high note, the fall on your knees part or the O Night Divine part, just gets me every time. Sometimes during Christmas, I'll just make a playlist in Spotify of like 12 different versions of O Holy Night and just play it. I love this song and I love this verse in particular, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. A weary world rejoices. That's where we are. Maybe we're in the weariness and I'm hoping that I can get you a little bit to the rejoicing. Uh, the weary world rejoices, why? Because Light is coming. New creation is coming. Hope is coming. We heard it in the passage from Isaiah tonight. Behold, I make new heavens. I make new earth. 
So maybe we are weary. Maybe we are too weary to hear these words, and I get that. This has been a wearying year for so many reasons. Um, I think especially of, of the people who are literally weary, the people that are on the front lines of this pandemic. When you talk to people in the medical profession, um, I have friends up in Amarillo where I'm from, and they're getting hit so hard, and they have lots of nurses quitting. They just can't handle it anymore. It's so wearying to be on the front lines of this. So maybe you're weary in that way. And so when you hear these words from Paul tonight in 1 Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, you're like, maybe not today, Paul. Maybe I can catch up with you later. <laughs> but I'm not ready to give thanks in all circumstances and rejoice always, let alone pray without ceasing. What in the world does that mean? So maybe we are too weary to hear that exhortation and I get that too. And if that's where you are, if, you're in, if you find yourself among the weary world, I would invite you, invite all of us, myself, to remember the way in which we sing, rejoice in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Because that's that way that we sing that that line, and it has so much mournful longing in it, I think shows us that there's space within the Christian life and joy for that sort of mournful longing. Rejoice, rejoice. The way that we sing that word, it doesn't almost fit, but it fits perfectly. You know, it's supposed to be a happy word, but we're singing it in a sad way. And I love that because in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, it, it gives us that push and pull that I think is built into our Christian year, and it's built into our Christian year because it's built into the Christian life. The push and the pull between weeping and rejoicing, and the push and the pull between fasting and feasting. Weeping, rejoicing, fasting, and feasting. Those are all built into the church year, and it's built into the season of Advent. It's, it's some people call Advent a, a, a mini Lent. But here we are in the middle, and we have the joy candle reminding us even in the midst of the tiny Lent that there is joy to be had. Even in the midst of Lent itself, every Sunday is still a feast day. Even in the midst of penitence, even in the midst of self-reflection, it's built in the push and the pull between lamenting and rejoicing, fasting and feasting. And the reason that I, I say this is because I want you to get this point, that whatever Christian joy is, it has to take that into account. And whatever Christian joy is, it isn't sort of a world-denying, head-in-the-sand sort of joy. And I think that, you know, talking about joy now is sort of a dangerous thing, maybe. <laughs> because maybe, like, if you felt joy, you'd feel kind of guilty. I've seen some of that on social media. Maybe you have, too, right? Somebody's having a good day, and it's like, how dare you have a good day? Everybody else is, you're not allowed to have joy right now. But whatever Christian joy is, it's not ignoring that things are hard. But in the midst of that is singing rejoice, rejoice. The weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. That push and the pull, you hear it in the Psalm from tonight, Psalm 126, verse five. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. The push and the pull between fasting and feasting, weeping and rejoicing. So the question before us tonight is this, how do we cultivate this kind of joy? especially if we find ourselves to be weary right now. If we are the weary world who can't yet rejoice, how do we cultivate this kind of joy? And to start to answer that question, I wanna start with a theological point, meaning I wanna say something about the nature of God. So put on your hard hats. It could get dangerous, we're gonna do some theology. I wanna begin with a theological point which is this, if God is love, then he is joy too. If God is love, then he is joy too. This is what I mean by that. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that community of persons delight in one another, that the overflow of their love is joyous, that joy is the overflow of the abundance of love. The Father delights in the beloved Son, the beloved Son, delights in the Father and the Holy Spirit is the bridge and bond of love between them, the movement of joy and love within them. And in, in our own salvation and how we experience and how we're united with God, we have this joy too, is that the love of God by the power of the Holy Spirit is poured into our hearts, overflowing in abundance of joy so it might cry, Abba, Father, 
And that same spirit joins us to the son who brings us to the father. Let me put it a different way. In your own life, think of the deepest joys that you've experienced. Those times where nobody had to tell you to rejoice, you just did. It was a spontaneous overflow of delight and joyful, exuberant delight. There's no other better word. At those times where we experience our deepest joy, I would argue is always connected to things that we love and persons that we love, that it is love stirring within us that overflows into joy and rejoicing. And that is so because that is the character and the nature of God who is the one telling us to rejoice. God's invitation to us is to rejoice what I rejoice in. He rejoices first in himself, but he also rejoices in what he makes and how he redeems and in those he redeems. Listen to these verses from our reading from Isaiah. Chapter 65, verses 18 and 19. This is the Lord speaking. He says, be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. These verses give us compactly a picture of a God who rejoices. A God who rejoices in what he has made. A God who rejoices in those he has redeemed. And the invitation for us to rejoice is to rejoice in the God who rejoices in us to rejoice in what he creates, to rejoice in how he redeems. He establishes a people of joy and a place of joy. Notice that from these verses too. I create Jerusalem to be a joy. I call my people into this place of joy to be a people of joy. And what all this adds up to is the reality that we become a people of joy by beholding the God who is joy. You may have heard this phrase before, behold and become. It's the vision statement, right? Isaiah, in this larger section of Isaiah that these verses come from, Isaiah gives a devastating, scathing denunciation of idols. And he has all these images of, oh, you made this thing with your hands and it just sits there and you worship it. You drag it around on donkey carts and you worship it you're going to become paralyzed like that idol. You're going to become mute like that idol because Isaiah understands this reality of spiritual physics, which is whatever you attend to, whatever you behold, you become like that thing. You become like the people that you hang out with. You become like the God that you worship, whether that be a false God or the true God. This is a fundamental insight into human nature. Whatever it is you behold, you become. So if we want to become people of joy, we have to behold joy and joy is in the face of God who is joy in himself because he is love. So that's the theological point. That undergirds everything else. If we don't get that, then we will settle for a joy that is incomplete. We'll settle for a joy that denies the world. We'll settle, settle for a joy that's about us and not about God. So the question is, how do we cultivate this kind of joy, especially if we find ourselves weary? The first point, we remember that our joy comes from the God who is joy. And the second point is that we remember that that joy is cultivated in us by the Spirit. You'll remember that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's number two, right after love. Love joy, peace, patience, kindness, and on and on. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit meaning it's something that God does in us. So connect the first point to the second point. The God who is joy gives his spirit to us to cultivate love and joy and peace and all the rest within us. And I want you to hang on to that word cultivate because that's how you bring forth fruit. You have to cultivate the ground. You have to cultivate the soil. This last Tuesday night, we um, had our... I'm doing an online version of this class, Practicing the King's Economy. We had a really great discussion this week about creation care. And uh, Aaron mentioned this movie that I had seen, and I, was just, I kept thinking about the movie after he mentioned it, but the movie is The Biggest Little Farm. 
which is a documentary about this couple who gets this land in California to try to bring it back. And when they get to the land, it just looks like dry nothingness. I mean, it's just kind of like, eh, what, what are they gonna do with this? But they get linked up with this guy who says, the thing that you have to do, we well, gotta start composting. We're gonna make compost tea. And they have this huge tank that's just full of, I mean, brown gunk. And all the stuff that they put in it to make this compost, and they just spray it all over their land. And over time, this grass comes back. And when the grass comes back, the bugs come back. And when the bugs come back, the birds come back. And when the birds come back, the things that eat birds come back. And this whole ecosystem grows out of the fact that they cultivated the soil, that they spent their time cultivating the soil. And there's a scene in the movie where this crazy rainstorm comes. It's just flooding, deluge everywhere, and everybody else's land gets flooded out, but not theirs. Because they had cultivated the soil, there was this grass, there was vegetation, there was life that, that could withstand the deluge. That's a picture of Christian joy. Is when the deluge comes, there's still something hanging on because we've allowed the spirit to cultivate in us his fruit. Over the last few weeks, when we were preaching on the themes from being Christian, when we talked about baptism and scripture and Eucharist and prayer, those are means by which God has given us to cultivate the soil within us so that the Holy Spirit can bring forth his fruit. We could add to that Christian community. We could add to that the spiritual disciplines. We could talk about mission. There's lots of things you could put on that list. But those are the ways in which God has given us to cultivate the soil within us so that the Spirit can bring forth his fruit, which is joy. And this is what Paul is getting at when he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Because those two things also are means by which we cultivate the soil within us. Prayer and gratitude. And sometimes when we're the weary one, it's, it's enough just to be sit, sat next to the person who's not weary <laughs> because we're a body. Sometimes you hear all this stuff, it's like, I can't do all this stuff. Well, we're all called to be a people of joy, but some people have it more than others. <laughs> so get around them. Get around joyful people. Not world-denying, suffering, denying people, but people who have been through it and yet are still joyful. That's another way that the Spirit cultivates our own joy within us. So how do we cultivate this kind of joy, especially if we find ourselves weary? First, we remember that God is joy. Second, we remember that the God who is joy cultivates joy within us. And then the third thing I, would, I wanna say is this, is that we cultivate this joy by remembering that joy is our way through suffering, not our way around suffering. Let me say that again. Joy is our way through suffering, not our way around suffering. How do you keep Christian joy from being world-denying joy? You take this point seriously, <laughs> that it's a means by which we go through the fire of suffering. That's in our Psalm too, that same verse. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. The tears are real. In that Psalm, these are people who were in exile. These were people who were in a land of death and told they were gonna go back to a land of life. They have suffered. Those are people who have experienced exile. And I would say that Christian joy that is sourced in the love of God and cultivated in us by the Spirit is not the face of Christian denial of the world's suffering, but the face of Christian resilience in the midst of suffering. That kind of joy is resilience in the midst of that suffering. And if that weren't true, this statement from James's letter would just be insanity. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials. Count it joy when you suffer. Why? How could that be true? Well, it's true because it's true of Jesus. The writer of the Hebrews tells us to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for what? For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. How did Jesus endure the cross? How did he despise the shame of the cross? Because of the joy that was set before him. 
What was that joy? It's the joy of the bridegroom winning his bride, the church. And that's what John was talking about. He's standing, I'm the best man, John the Baptist says. I'm the best man at the wedding. And the bridegroom is here and he's here to get his bride and now my joy is full. And the joy set before Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, the joy that allowed him to go through suffering, to go to the cross, to endure the cross and to despise its shame is that joy the joy of the deepest delight of love for his bride, the church. And that is the joy that is cultivated in us. And that cannot be a world denying joy because it suffers. So the cross reminds us what joy costs. Joy is not cheap. Joy that flows from the depths of the heart of God and swells up within us costs the life of the beloved son. The father who delighted in the son sent his son into the world to live among us, to die for us. So joy is not cheap. Joy is costly. Joy is the means by which Jesus, who is the pioneer, takes us through suffering and not around it. There's no way around it. Can we all just, can, if that, this year's taught us anything, there ain't no way around it. <laughs> You're gonna go through it but you can go through it with joyful expectation that yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, handed over to suffering and death, he sat with his disciples, he gave them a meal, and he said this in the Gospel of John, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The joy that the Lord wants to give us is his own joy the Lord who rejoices in that which he creates, the joy that he has over his, the place that he has established and the people that he has established. So how do we cultivate the kind of joy that's not world denying? How do we cultivate the, this kind of joy when we find ourselves weary? First, we remember that God himself is joy. And second, we remember that he through his spirit, cultivates that joy in us through community, through prayer, through sacraments, through being around other joyful people, all these means he's given us. And thirdly, we remember that joy is our way through suffering and not our way around suffering. Let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for this great theme of joy. I thank you that your apostle Paul spoke of it so much, even in the midst of imprisonment, in the midst of terrible circumstances, he told your people and told us to rejoice always. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would cultivate the fruit of joy within us and that we could take that joy through the suffering that is inevitable in this life. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you went through it first and we know that you will take us where you are now. And for that, we praise you. In your name we pray, amen. Let us stand together joyfully and say the Nicene Creed as we confess our faith. Found on page eight in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. 
Greet one another safely with a sign of peace. So many deuces, so many pieces going up everywhere. I love to see it. Have a seat wherever you are. Peace to you. I'm so glad that you're here tonight. Thank you, Chris, for a wonderful word and reminder for us. There's no way around suffering. Joy is our way through it. I love that. Uh, just a few quick announcements. If this is your first time with us, or maybe you've been here literally dozens of times, but you've never filled out the connection card, boy, would we love for you to do that. Fill it out. Put it in the offering bucket or plate as it's uh, out in the narthex. We'll follow up with you, get you folded into the life of the community here. Don't forget, as the year winds down, you think about your end-of-year giving. Don't forget St. Bart's. Thank you for your faithful giving, especially in a year like this. We're so grateful for the way that God has provided for us through you all. So please continue that as the year closes. Also, one last reminder, anyone that you'd like to recommend to become a vestry member, please follow the instructions in the bulletin. The nominating committee will take those under consideration and then move forward with the process. Also, public theology, new night, same great time, same great place at Connie Rosso White Rock, but new night, Tuesday, December 15th, be there for public theology. And also, don't forget that we have that COVID uh, benevolence and relief fund. If you have been affected financially, uh, we have a financial hardship because of COVID, please follow the instructions on our website. Fill out that. We would love to help you. Also, Christmas Eve service coming up. It's still the 24th of December, believe it or not. Um, we do have a limited number of people allowed, and I don't know if it's full yet. Do we, do we know? We have a little bit left, just a smidgen. So you might be able to get in by the hair of your chinny chin chin. So go and register for Christmas Eve service. It'll be a wonderful night despite 2020. <laughs> All right, we've been having Advent interviews, haven't we? Where's that microphone? Let's see. Austin, would you be a doll? I mean, or, or dude, whichever. And grab me that microphone. I'm going to invite Julia Fisher to come up. You may know Matt and Julia and their beautiful daughters, Isabella and Naomi. Uh, Julia is going to be our Advent interview for this week. Thank you. We just hand that over to Julia. Julia, we're so glad that you're here. And you guys moved here from, was it New Haven, Connecticut? Yeah, can I take this off? You can totally take that off. Yeah. You're safe. We're all safe. It feels weird to be unmasked. To bear your face. People. You've been unmasked. You guys moved here from Connecticut, right? We were Ish. in Connecticut, but we were actually in Pittsburgh right before this, oh. but for only two years, okay. so it was a little bit of a Slightly flip. better than Connecticut. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. I have a lot of friends from Pittsburgh. I'm sorry, <laughs> McDonald's and Morales, et cetera. Well, I'm going to ask you the same interview questions I ask everybody. Yes. Uh, tell us how you got to St. Bart's, you and your family. Yeah, so we um, moved here last May, and we were brought here by... Um, Matt's job, and we reconnected with a good friend from college who's become an even better friend. We kind of knew each other loosely in college. Um, we went to a college in California, and her name's Paige Wooster, and she Woo -woo. invited us, her and her husband, um, Zach, who we also got to, who we got to meet for the first time, and again, we already knew Paige, and it was so fun reconnecting with them. They invited us to the church. My understanding is that Paige's cousin heard about it from Cassie Lewis, so <laughs> yay for the chain of connections. And our first Sunday here, we just knew right away it was going to be our church home. I mean, yeah. it really was kind of bizarre how immediately we felt at home. And I just have to say, Jay, you remembered our names. You asked oh, them, yeah. first of all, which is notable, and then you remembered them when we took communion and... That was very oh, that was touching. Cool. So oh, that's wonderful. Didn't go unnoticed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, that's a great story. I love that. Have you noticed <laughs> that that people end up at St. Bart's because somebody told them and somebody else had told them? It's just I love that. It's very beautiful and uh, serendipitous. So you guys have been here uh, eighteen months ish, yeah. right? So what about is about as old as my second daughter is? That's okay. So we can look at Naomi and she know. Was born. Yeah. So what has God done in your life as you since you've been at St. Bart's? Yeah, I of course have some notes to keep me focused here. Um, 
So two big things. First of all, um, St. Bart's has really provided good supportive community for us. Um, of course, just on the practical level of being new to Dallas, to mm -hmm. Texas in general, it's been a real godsend. Um, I'm a therapist, specifically I do art therapy, so it also was just a very warm, supportive group of a lot of therapists. You yeah. also happened to mention that the first Sunday we were here, which oh, feels yeah. a little serendipitous. Um, so provided that community that's supportive, very genuine, very warm and authentic. Um, and then also illuminated the importance of church history and liturgy, we've always been drawn to that sort of church, and so this felt very fitting for us. Yeah, awesome. That's wonderful. So, you know, Chris mentioned tonight, this is a dark, gloomy season. Yeah. We've talked about, you know, obviously 2020 is, is what it is. So, if for people who are feeling discouraged, feeling the ache of life, or just that, that dissonance of Advent, what word or picture um, would you share with them in order to encourage them? Yeah. This was my favorite question, oh, especially you. as a therapist. You know, I am often face suffering in other people and, of course, in myself as well. Um, and I would say two things. Um, first of all, know that you're not alone. Um, not only is that ache and that suffering a very universally human experience, it's also a divine one. You know, hmm. we serve a God that... Um, calls us into a relationship with a God who is familiar with suffering and knows the ache of loss and grief. Um, so, so really take that in because that, that's no small thing. And I myself, even as I say it, I still meditate on that and comprehend what that means for me. And then second of all, perhaps think of the ache as more of a homesickness sometimes. Mm -hmm a homesickness for um, something more holistic and a reminder that things aren't completely right and as they should be and that the ache and the homesickness is meant to be there as a calling of ourselves to a time when things will be right. Yeah, wow, that's really good. You're, you're really gifted at speaking. This is wonderful. Oh, wow, thanks. I mean, I mean that's so true, though. Like... It, because sometimes when we feel that ache and that longing, we're like, ah, oh, you know, I'm the only one, but it's actually a sign of health. It shows that we're alive to the world and, and we're alive to the kingdom that is coming. Yep. So in, to sum it all up, as you reflect on y'all's time here, you know, what does St. Bart's mean to you? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back to the uh, liturgy mm -hmm. part of my, for our second answer. Sure. Um, and St. Bart's to me has really meant a provision of framework um, for living out my faith in a very practical way. Like I said, we have, we've gone to an Episcopal church before, we've been familiar with liturgy in different ways, but this has been a time in our lives when we've been practicing it the most consistently. Hmm. And so um, I've really been drawn to the rhythm and the seasons that the church provides, um, and how it's a reminder that, you know, Sunday isn't just this once a week occurrence to attend church, but how those rhythms and seasons, even daily office, which in my own life I've felt called to like read the morning psalm that's mm -hmm. in the daily office, it's a whole way of positioning your week, mm -hmm. and then your month, and your year, and then mm -hmm. your life, you mm -hmm. know, it's like fasting, daily office, all these things yeah. have really meant a lot to us. So it's, it's a reminder that we're participating in something that's divine, and it's a divine pattern that's larger than how we personally feel in the mm. moment. Like, do I want to go today or not? Mm -hmm. And at the end, even though that is valid, and with COVID sometimes that's practically very hard, mm -hmm. it's, it's bigger than us too. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank Look, you. Can we pray for you? Please, okay, thank you. God in heaven, thank you so much for Matt and Julia and the girls, and thank you for what Julia described, this dance that, that her family has been ushered into by your spirit, with your people, and just that sense of being cultivated, 
uh, through time and through liturgy. Lord, thank you for her openness, her encouragement for us. And I pray that that same encouragement would be just flooded to the Fisher household, that you would fill it with your Holy Spirit, that your holy angels would guard and protect them, and that you'd continue to provide for their every need. Lord, thank you for the Fishers, and thank you for St. Bart's, this, this people that we can call our own. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Julia. Let's give her a round of applause. You just sat on the piano. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Wonderful. My goodness. I love the Advent interviews. They're so fun.